Hey everybody, welcome to Juice TV. My name is Noah and I'm coming to you from the Queensland Children's Hospital. Today, I'm not just a patient, I'm your guide to an incredible science adventure. Did you know that science helps us protect endangered animals and keeps our planet healthy? We're about to explore some amazing stories about species survival and conservation. First up, we're diving into the world of whales with the kids from hospital school who have a fascinating experiment about whale snipe. Next, we're heading out to the Charleville Bilby Experience, where Ruby will introduce us to some of Australia's most adorable and endangered creatures. Prepare for some prehistoric fun as Aurelia, Jamie, and Willow discover the jaw-dropping dinosaurs of Patagonia. And finally, Abby and Patrick will show us how we can help protect sea turtles and clean up our oceans. Before we get to all that fun, let's conduct a little experiment of our own with a study I like to call Quick Questions. One thing I would do is to protect all endangered animals is to have flashing signs on the side of the roads. That way, you know when an animal's about to cross the road. Just like a burn gate at a train station. If I could invent and get it to a safe the environment, it would be a deep dive robot with claw arms and a little compartment that opens up and that the claw can just put inside all the trash. So that way it cleans not just above the surface of the water, but under it too. I do have pets at home. One of them is a Pomeranian, she is chaotic. And one of them is a cat, she can be calm at times. They don't like each other, we have to separate them. Cats and dogs fighting, who would afford it? Introducing Tilly and Luna. If I could help any endangered animal, it'd be an orca because it's awful seeing them in captivity. You know when their fins are just like floppy? That means they are distressed, they want to get out of there. They're a beautiful creature and they deserve to be in the wild. Something that makes me happy is wrestling. I've been a fan for a year now, thanks to my uncle. The action figures he gave me started my peak interest in wrestling. My uncle hooked me up with two action figures. Ever since then, I started watching each show and I haven't missed a beat of every episode. My favorite wrestlers are Roman Reigns and Jey Uso. They're not on the best of terms right now. I love Jey Uso because his character is so good. He plays a heel and a babyface so great. The yeet chants he'll give from the crowd are so vibrant and loud. Just the re one of the reasons I love Jey Uso. And why I would want to meet him in person. Roman Reigns is one of my favorites because I acknowledge my tribal chief. That was so much fun. Let's get into some science action. For our first segment, we're diving into the world of whales with a fascinating experiment down at the Juice TV studio. Hi, I'm Katie. I'm Lucas. And I'm Isaac. And we're from the Queensland Children's Hospital School. And we're coming to you from the Juice TV studio. And what better place to celebrate National Science Week? It's Australia's annual celebration of science and technology. <laughs> This year's theme is about species survival and more than just sustainability. We're all a big part of the interconnected web of life. Every creature from the bees that pollinate our fruit trees to the whales that travel our seas. Their survival doesn't just protect nature's beauty. It ensures the health of the planet. For the food, the clean water and the air we breathe. In the lead up to Science Week, we've been enjoying this book. It's called The Walk of the Whales. The story goes like this. Because of all the rubbish in the ocean, the whales moved onto the land. Imagine you saw a whale swimming in your swimming pool. Or riding your bike down the street. You'd be pretty upset. When a little girl discovers that people have filled the whales' homes with rubbish, they work together to clean the oceans so the whales can happily return home. There's so many things we can do to keep our beautiful marine life safe. There's some really fun ways to check how healthy they are. The Whale Snot Experiment. Healthy snot equals healthy whale equals healthy ocean. Let's do it. 
with the help of our own science wizard. Hi kids! Hi everyone! My name's Josephine and I'm from the Queensland Children's Hospital School. We're here for the whale star experiment. What's it all about? Well kids, if we are to have healthy oceans, we need healthy whales. So how would we go about testing if our whales are healthy? With their snot. Yeah. Exactly! By testing whale snot, we can see what the pH level or the glucose level is and that will tell us if our whales are healthy. So what do we need for this experiment? We're going to need a whale snot sample, pH test paper and glucose test sticks. Whale snot sample? Where'd you get, you know what, I don't even want to know. So the first thing we're going to do is put our pH paper into our whale snot sample. Katie? The chemicals in the whale snot are reacting with the paper. Let's see what's happening. Now it's time for a glucose test. Thank you, Isaac. That's right. Glucose in whale snot is not very good. So we're going to put the test strip in. And if there's no glucose, we've got a healthy whale. That's looking good, Lucas. Let's put that out next to our pH test. Very good. We can check whether or not our whale has any glucose. The next substance we're going to test is vinegar. Isaac? Put that pH strip into your vinegar and place it on the paper so we can test the pH. Let's have a look. It's a four. It's a four. Now, Isaac, let's see if there's any glucose in vinegar. Let's put that next to our pH test. Mm, we'll check. Katie, you're going to test bicarbonate soda. This is often in cakes and recipes. We don't use a lot of it, and you're about to see why. Let's put that piece of paper down. Whoa, what colour is that? It's a nine. That's a nine. No, we don't want a nine for our whale snot. That would be a very unhealthy whale. Katie, let's check the glucose levels of bicarbonate of soda. Thank you, Katie. Let's have a look at that glucose strip. And lastly, we're going to test lemonade. Lucas, can you do a pH test on the lemonade? Let's have a look at that pH level. Mmm, that's a four. Who would have thought? Now let's finish with a glucose test on your lemonade. Oh, we've got glucose in lemonade. But what do we know about lemonade? Lemonade has sugar in it, doesn't it? That's right, Katie. It does. The pH test is four for the lemonade, and there's so much glucose in it too. For vinegar, the pH test is a three, and there's no glucose at all. A bicarb soda has a pH of nine, but it has no glucose. The star of our experiment, the whale snot, it has a perfect pH level of 5.5 with no glucose. So scientists are looking for different ways on how they can monitor the health of animals across the world. Testing whale snot is just one way of doing this. An Australian researcher has found a way to use a drone to collect whale snot. She then tests the whale snot to monitor the health of the whales. We can all keep our oceans safe with the five R's. Refuse, reduce, reuse, repurpose and recycle. Thanks for joining us today, guys. And I hope you have a whaley good time for National Science Week. Bye! Bye. Wow, that was fascinating. Who knew something so gross? You could teach us a lot about whales. Now let's switch gears and travel to Charleville, where Ruby's going to introduce us to some adorable endangered animals. Hello, 
my name is Ruby. Welcome to the Charleville Bilby Experience. This is a really fun place where we can learn about one of Australia's most unique creatures, the Bilby. Inside you'll find lots of cool Bilby trinkets, souvenirs, plenty of fun Bilby facts, and you'll even get to see Bilbies up close. Time to meet some of our friends and find out all about these beautiful animals. Here to tell us about these amazing creatures is Sophie. Hey Ruby, welcome to the Charleville Bilby Experience. Have you ever seen a bilby before? Yes. Yeah, that's awesome. And I have lots of questions. Are bilbies fast and do, when do they sleep? Bilbies are super fast. They can get up to 15 kilometres an hour, but only in really short bursts, just to really get away from whatever's scaring them. And bilbies are nocturnal, so they're actually out and about at night time. So when we're asleep, they're out and about finding food, running around, digging lots of holes. And so yeah, they're nocturnal. What about the things that they eat? And where can you find them? Okay, so bilbies are omnivores, so they eat pretty much everything. They eat insects, lizards, sometimes even mice too, but they also eat grass and roots. Honestly, whatever they can get their little mouth on, they'll probably eat it. And so bilbies, they used to cover 70% of Australia, but nowadays you can only find them in about 15% of Australia. So nowadays you can only find them in the really far dry corners of Queensland and also up in the top corners of Western Australia and Northern Territory. So yeah, not very many places nowadays. And one of the biggest threats to bilbies are wild cats. You're completely right, Ruby. So cats are actually a huge problem in Australia for bilbies and a lot of our other animals. But for bilbies specifically, a lot of animals that we have trouble with include foxes and rabbits as well. And so cats and foxes, they both go after the bilby to eat them, but rabbits, they eat the bilby food source, but also take over their burrows as well, which is pretty sad, isn't it? Yeah. So here at the Charleville Bilby Experience, it's actually really important here because we're a breeding facility, but we're also a public display. So people get to see the bilbies and fall in love with them. So the bilbies here at the Charleville Bilby Experience have a really important job to teach people about bilbies and also just give them that knowledge and awareness of how cool they are and what we have to do to save them. Thank you, Sophie, for sharing so many facts about bilbies. Thanks for coming along today, Ruby. It was lovely to meet you. And I look forward to seeing all you guys sometime soon to come see our bilbies. And thank you, Barry and Melinda, for being superstars. I love animals. In fact, my granny rescues them. She nurses them back to her health and lets them back into the wild. Sometimes I get to help her. I feed the little joeys, but sometimes I have to pick up poo. Yeah. This book is filled with Bilby Buddies. Thousands of people who donated money to fund a predator-proof fence. Thanks for hanging out with me at the Charleville Bilby Centre. See you later. It's incredible to see how much effort is put in to protecting Bilbies. Next, we're taking a trip back in time at the Queensland Museum. Aurelia, Jamie, and Willow are getting up close and personal with some of the most jaw-dropping creatures ever to walk the planet. Hello, Juice TV. My name's Jamie. My name's Aurelia. We've come to the Queensland Museum for an exciting adventure, to see an exhibit that was 250 million years in the making. We're gonna see dinosaurs!
at this one, guys. Eobeliosaurus. Mephi. <laughs> Thanks for showing us the exhibit today, Jonathan. We'd love to know more about what a paleontologist does. Yeah, so paleontologists, we study all aspects of life in the past. That's everything from giant dinosaurs down to tiny, tiny microscopic life forms. Yeah, if it left a fossil, we were interested in it. Uh, right now we're in a golden age of dinosaur discovery. There are more species being named every day all around the world at a faster rate than at any time in history. So it's a really quite exciting time. This is Carnotaurus. Now, Carnotaurus name means meat-eating bull because it's got horns on its head, almost like a bull. But it's got these tiny little arms that don't really do much. They're highly mobile, so it can wave its arms around a lot, but it can't do a lot with those. They're so short. Jonathan, which dinosaur do you think would make a great pet? Well, obviously most of the ones we've seen today are a bit big. They aren't going to fit in your house or your yard. They would cost a fortune to feed, I should think, as well. But weirdly, one of the best dinosaurs as a pet you can still actually get now. So my niece has a pet dinosaur. It's a little budgie, because birds are actually a living group of dinosaurs. So yeah, you can have a pet dinosaur if you want. I'm never going to look at birds the same way again. Have I got a dinosaur teddy at home? Yeah, yeah I do actually. And I've got dinosaur pyjamas to go with it. Very comfortable too. All right everybody, we've found the world's largest dinosaur. This is the Patago Titan. That's right, Aurelia. This is one of the very biggest dinosaurs known from anywhere. It's a herbivore, obviously. The biggest dinosaurs are always herbivores. They eat plants. It's a real good question as to how they get so big. Uh, we think that dinosaurs like this are particularly big because they uh, eat very poor quality plants and they need giant guts to process that to get any energy out of it. So essentially the giant body is to carry around their giant gut. It'll be back in the ribcage there. <laughs> a dinosaur this big? It would take years and years, sometimes decades. So the initial excavation in the field can take months. Getting it back into the lab and removing the rock from the bone itself, that can take many, many years. Piecing that, that sort of puzzle together can take a very long time indeed. Have a look at this. This is the actual bones of the Patago Titan. So you'd think this would take a massive team of archaeologists to find this, with all of the latest technology. But fun fact, it was just found by a dog on his daily walk in Patagonia. <laughs> this Patago Titan is 38.2 metres long. Willow is 1.1 metres tall. Jamie is 1.2 metres tall. And I'm 1.4 metres tall. If we all stood on each other's head and there were 30 of each of us, we'd be as long as the Patago Titan. the tour today. Oh, it's my pleasure. Hopefully I'll see you all in the museum again soon. Dinosaurs are so cool. Can you believe how big those things were? Now it's time for our final segment. We're going back to the museum to hang out with Abby. 
Hello, my name is Abby and I'm at the Queensland Museum. I'm on an important mission to save the turtles. I'm here to discover what we can do to help save our marine mates. Now, this is a big mission, so we've called in a big name in the biz. Meet Patrick Cooper, a.k.a. the Turtle Expert. He has an amazing display here for the World Science Festival, which will help us on our mission. Patrick, where do turtles come from? Well, these turtles come from Mon Repo. Have you heard of Mon Repo? It's a beach up near Bundaberg. Ooh! And Mon Repo is uh, where scientists have been monitoring turtles for 50 years. Wow! In Finding Nemo, there are two turtles called Crush and Squirt. Do the turtles really ride the EAC? Is it really true they do? Yep. Do you know what the EAC stands for? East Australian Current! That's right, and they do do it. So these little loggerheads, when they hatch at Mon Repo, they run down the beach, they swim about 80 kilometres offshore, and they get picked up by the Eastern Australian Current. Wow! And that takes them down the Eastern Australian coast, past the tip of New Zealand, and over to the coast of South America. Oh my goodness! Do they go to California? No, they don't go to California. But once they're over in the coast of South America, off Chile and Peru, they stay there before they get back to Australia. It's about 16 years. And when, 16 yeah, years? Yeah. That's two years of my age. <laughs> and and, and when, when they get back here, it's another 14 years before they're big enough to start going and breeding at the nesting beaches. Oh, my goodness. That is amazing. What did the turtles eat? Well, when they're little like this, they ride on the surface of the ocean currents and they're eating anything they encounter. So they're eating little invertebrates, little things like uh, larval fish, um, small squid, any insects that fall out of the atmosphere. Yeah. But, but while they're doing that, that makes them very vulnerable to eating plastics in the ocean too because they yeah. pick up little floating objects. Yes. And when they grow to adults, they're eating things like big crustaceans, so crayfish, crabs, and they eat mollusks, so shellfish. Do you become a turtle expert? Well, I'm not really a turtle expert. I, I sort of am. I, I work here as senior curator of reptiles at the museum, and uh, my knowledge of turtles comes from working closely with Colin Olympus, who runs the turtle project within the Department of Environment and Science. So I've done studies on nesting beaches. I've helped them catch turtles in Moreton Bay. I spent three weeks up on Crab Island off Cape York with my wife at one stage Where's monitoring Cap crab Island? Right up near the tip of Cape York in far north Queensland. What's happening in these boxes? Well, these are our transparent incubators, and we put the eggs in there so the public, when they come through, can see the turtles hatching. So normally this happens at the bottom of a nest chamber, 60 centimetres below the sand, and nobody can see what's going on. So we do this where people can actually watch the whole process. What is an incubator? An incubator is a container with a controlled temperature, so we try and keep these temperatures around 29 degrees because that's a suitable temperature to hatch the eggs out. How long does it take for them to hatch? It depends a bit on the temperature, so cooler temperatures take longer, but the first of these eggs started hatching after 50 days incubation. Oh, <laughs> I love it when I see baby animals like these. Yeah, well, little turtles are really cute. Everybody loves these little turtles. Yeah. Are any of these guys ready for a swim? They may be. Why, would you like to put a turtle in a tank for its first swim? I think that this sounds wonderful. When you hold it, hold it like that and just put your finger gently on top. Can you do that? So hand out flat and just put your finger gently on top, not too hard, gently, and just bring it up. And if you just put it over there and drop it in. Yeah, there you go. Yes! How's that? that He's enjoying awesome. that, isn't he? How long do turtles live for? 
Nobody really knows because no single scientist has managed to follow a turtle right through its whole life, but we know the turtles that are nesting at the beaches up at Monroe Po start nesting when they're about 30 years old, and some of those turtles they've been following for 40 years. So we know that at 70 years of age, those turtles are still laying eggs, those eggs are still hatching, and the feeling is that turtles probably go to about 80 years of age. They probably don't make it to 100. Oh, wow. How big do they grow? Well, in that 30-year period, they go from these tiny little hatchlings to adults that have a, a carapace, which is the shell length of about a metre long. Oh, my goodness. That's as long as a turtle in a wildlife park. <laughs> and we can show you an adult turtle, so there's, there's one okay. out on display out there, so we can show you how big they grow. Okay. Whoa, this is the biggest turtle I've ever seen! Well, that's a loggerhead turtle, Abby. That's um, the same sort as you're looking at with the little babies before. Oh, and, and that one would be about 30 years old, but they do get a bit bigger than that. And at that size, it's ready to start laying eggs. How many species of turtle are there? There are seven species of marine turtles in the world, and we have six of those here in Australia. I want to know what type of turtles are crush and squirt? Crush and squirt from Finding, Finding Nemo. Nemo. I, they were green turtles. Green turtles? Yes. Wow. Did you see what I did? You so totally rock, squirt! So give me some fin. Noggin. Dude. These turtles have a big journey out of us. What can we do to help them? Well, there's so many things we can do to help turtles, especially when they're little. You know, things like driving on nesting beaches with four-wheel drives isn't a good idea. Turtles get either run over or, or stuck in uh, wheel tracks. If you live near the beach, you can uh, be sensitive about the lighting. The little turtles find their way to the sea because the horizon over the sea is lighter than that on the land. So if we've got street lights and house lights in behind the dune, some of those turtles wander inland. But one of the major problems the turtles have now, particularly the little turtles, is with plastics in the ocean. Ocean. Plastics are really bad and plastics are everywhere. So to show this, I went out and started collecting plastics. So this case shows plastics that are washing up on beaches. Some of these are from Queensland, there's some from New South Wales. I've got samples from Florida. Um, that little piece there, somebody collected for me from South America. And the plastic gets really bad when it starts to break down. So these hard plastics, when they break down in the sunlight and in the ocean, they're the sort of things those little turtles eat. And we're finding lots of little turtles have plastic in their guts now. Oh, that's sad. So what we've got here are samples of plastics that have actually been taken out of the guts of turtles and seabirds. These things are killing our little turtles out in the ocean. So this little bit of cable tie here was taken out of a small turtle and it blocked its gut and killed the turtle. Aww. And plastics like that are also really, really bad for seabirds. Oh no! So this bird here is called a flesh-footed shearwater and it comes from Lord Howe Island. And this plastic here was taken from the flesh-footed shearwater colony on Lord Howe Island. It's been all picked up at sea and brought back by the adult birds to feed to their chicks. Patrick, what do you have here? Well, these are the winners in an art competition we had. We had a competition called uh, Hatchery Crusaders, and kids at various schools made uh, turtle artworks. So that's something else you can do, Abby. You can reuse plastics and uh, be creative with them. So instead of throwing them out, you can make wonderful artworks like this. And you know, you, you might like to make one at home that your parents can hang on the wall and uh, decorate the house. What do you think? And it's good if you do it with plastics you pick up out of the environment. Yeah. So if you go to a beach and get a hold of litter off the beach and make some nice artwork out of it. So 
So Abby, you can see why plastics are really bad. We've all got to change our, the way we use plastics. We've got to think about recycling. We've got to think about saying no to plastic if you don't need it. If you're buying things in shops and they've got heaps and heaps of wrapping, try and avoid it. The plastic is really bad in the environment. We're talking now that there are 8 to 12 million tonnes of plastic <gasps> going into the ocean every year. Oh no! There are over 100 million tonnes of plastic in the oceans now. We're making 300 million tonnes of plastic a year and every 11 years that figure's doubling. So we've got to start saying no to plastics, have other things to use, and there are alternatives. And I'm going to give you an alternative. Have, oh. you, have you heard of a bamboo toothbrush? Have you got a bamboo toothbrush? No. No, well this is just like a normal toothbrush, but it's made out of bamboo, so you avoid having a plastic toothbrush, and I'm gonna give that to you, and you can try using that. Now, it's a bit funny when you first use it, because it's sort of like putting a bit of wood in your mouth, but you get used to it very quickly, and it does a very good job of cleaning teeth. So you can, so you can start buying things in the shops that aren't made of plastic, but do the same job. Thank you so much, Patrick. It's all right. I've never used a bamboo toothbrush. Well, before. I hope you enjoy it. So there you have it, everybody. This is how you save the turtles. Use plastic-free products. Always recycle. And if you see plastic on the beach, turn it into artwork. My name is Abby. Thank you for helping me to save the turtles. <laughs> Thanks, Abby. Turtles are such fascinating creatures, and it's great we can all pitch in to protect the ocean. And that wraps up our Science Week adventure. Before I go, I want to give a big shout out to my best mate, Jackson. He's recovering from having his tonsils removed. Hope you're feeling better soon, mate. Thanks for watching, everyone, and I will see you next time. <laughs>